In a time when all we hear is bad news, here's an inspiring story. John Duffy overcame incredible odds, growing up poor in the Bronx, to becoming the CEO of KBW, a major investment firm in New York City. As CEO, he not only weathered but prevailed over terrible tragedies from the events of 9-11, so much so that he even gathered the attention of the President of the United States. One New Yorker understood his corporate responsibility is a fellow named John Duffy. On September the 11th, KBW had its offices in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. That day, the firm lost 67 people, including John's 23-year-old son. Many thought KBW was finished, but not John Duffy. And he rebuilt his business. Last year, KBW went public, and now the firm has twice as many employees as it did on September the 11th. It says something about John Duffy that the terrorist attacks only made him more determined to succeed. I know you'll find him as fascinating as I do. Please enjoy a conversation with the amazing John Duffy. John, how are you doing? I'm doing fine today, Janice. Good to be on your podcast. Thank you so much for being here. We're thrilled to have you. Just to start off, a regular question. What would you attribute your rags to riches story? Well, I, uh, I grew up in New York City in the borough of the Bronx. Uh, parents were immigrants from Ireland. One older sibling. You know, I think life started to change for me a little bit in terms of the perception of more opportunity in my high school years. I went to an old boys Catholic high school in the South Bronx and uh, did well academically. And it was a very strict environment, but it presented a lot of opportunity. And as I did well in school, I became more engaged about, you know, what, what was my life going to be and what opportunities were there going to be and what kind of career was I going to have. I really didn't have what I would say a lot of um, role models or mentors that, you know, were relatives or, you know, part of the family. So I think teachers I had in high school, you know, I think one of the fellows that really made an impression on me was uh, a priest who was a world history teacher. You know, history was, you know, I didn't particularly like it or dislike it. It was just there. But he basically implored upon us to read the New York Times every day, which was not kind of on our reading list at home, um, you know, given the, you know, the social strata. And it's certainly not viewed as kind of a blue collar paper. But, you know, he took time, explained to us, you know, how big the world was, what was going on in the world currently, tried to get us to relate to some of that. And if I had to pick, you know, like one moment in high school where maybe the light went on a little bit, he uh, showed us the stock pages in the business section. It was a whole lot of numbers. I didn't have an idea of what any of them meant. But they looked a little bit like, you know, baseball batting averages or something, which I was more, much more familiar with. And I always kind of felt like I was pretty good in math and stuff like that. And he struck a curiosity note in me. That was where I started to think about what business was and, you know, what kind of career opportunities there might be there. I think that was a real eye-opener for me. I would have been probably 16 years old, junior year of high school. Well, I think I re remember you telling me that uh, you were like 11. Your dad had left home, and so you yes. had to go out and get a job. So you were familiar with the work environment. I was. What I was got kind like? of thrown into that a little earlier than uh, normal. What, what was your first uh, job? First job was uh, a paper route. I did that for two years, and then I got a job in the New York Public Library, uh, following in my sister's footsteps. She helped me get that job. And that probably opened my horizons a little bit on literature. You know, you had to know when you looked at a book where to put it on the shelf, whether it was, you know, history or a novel or biography. And they had the Dewey Decimal System or something. So, you know, I learned all that. Did that for two years. Then junior year of high school, I broke my shoulder, got a scholarship. I didn't have to work. That was my year, you know, one year off in uh, 55 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
and then went to work for in supermarkets for a couple of years. And then uh, during college, three years, I drove a cab in New York City. Wow. Which is an interesting experience. All of those jobs, obviously, you're dealing with the public. I think it helped me develop maybe some people skills because I was dealing with adults, you know, at a fairly young age and kind of figure out how to behave and maybe how to think on your feet a little bit. And certainly accept some responsibility, you know, at a pretty young age. So I think there were benefits to all of those jobs. I didn't want to have a career in any of them. But, right. you know, I, looking back or, you know, as I grew up, I think, you know, there was some, besides the paycheck, which was very important, I, you know, I think there was benefit. Sometimes you do something and you're like, nope, that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, there's a benefit to that rather than making that decision, you know, when you're out of college or something. The hard work, definitely. So that, that would be something you might attribute some of your success to as well. Yep. Well, I know George Bush mentioned you in one of his speeches about being a cab driver to being the CEO of one of the largest investment firms. That's quite a journey. Now, what year did you enter college then? 1967. 1967. So there's a lot going on. Well, first of all, it was the Kennedy assassination my freshman year in high school. I got out of high school in 67. So I remember that day. You know, and then 68, you know, when I'm in college, his brother Robert is assassinated. In between that, we had Martin Luther King. Initial race riots, at least in my consciousness, in New York were in 1965. There were nights that looked a lot like what we've seen happen around the country in the last month, unfortunately. You know, this is, you know, 50 plus years later and, and a lot looks the same. But there was so much change, and at least in my world as a teenager, you know, we had the we had the Beatles show up in late 63 or 64. It felt like music was going through, you know, a revolution. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah. So there was uh, there was a lot going on, a lot to process. I got out of high school in 67, went to City College in New York, went into the engineering program, did not do very well academically my first two semesters and uh, kind of led me to I think I went from a very disciplined, structured environment in high school where you almost couldn't screw up or you weren't allowed to goof off into a completely free form environment where if you didn't go to class, teacher never cared. And I missed some classes and my grades reflected it. And I was working also and trying to decide what I wanted to do for my life. So there were, there were certainly plenty of distractions. And the freshman year, I decided I needed to change majors and went into a liberal arts program at City College and wound up majoring in economics. So that was kind of your wake-up call. Yeah, freshman year in college, uh, you know, I had some friends. The Vietnam War was raging. Um, I had a close friend I had made at, at freshman year of college, and he would kind of decided it wasn't what he expected, and he was looking for a change, and he... I decided to join the Air Force. I wasn't sure that's what I was looking to do was fly around to the other side of the world and, you know, fight in a war that was becoming increasingly unpopular. So there was a lot going on. You know, uh, my mom at that point was a single parent. She was working two jobs. My sister had gotten married and she was out of the house. So I was kind of, I don't want to say I was by myself, I was living with my mother, but it was on me to kind of figure this out. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of direction or typical parental supervision. Right. Uh, you know, my mom, when I would go out at night, my mom would just tell me, don't get arrested. That stays on your record. <laughs> so like anything, anything short of getting arrested wasn't going to upset her too much which you know didn't lead to me coming home very early on a Friday or Saturday night. I but, can imagine. Um, a I, lot of kids would envy that. Enjoying life as a young adult. Uh, but, you know, I never got off the rails too far. You know, I understood that there wasn't a big support network for me. So, you know, whatever my life was going to be was going to probably be largely a function of what I made it. And I... I got very fortunate in my first 10 years out of college where I just got presented some, and in retrospect, they were incredible opportunities. And I kind of said yes to each of them and 
from both a learning perspective and a you know long term career perspective they 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 proved that they were great opportunities for me and i yeah you know, I worked hard and took advantage of those opportunities so yeah i didn't go i didn't have an i b league education you know city college was free the, the free education i mean what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, typical tuition for a decent school back then was about $1,500 a year. Uh, people from my neighborhood, if they went to college, they, they were going to college in New York. You know, they weren't flying around the country. Just wasn't, you know, it wasn't part of our world. An occasional one might go to, you know, a college in Boston or Washington, D.C., but that was about as far as any of my classmates from high school would have gone. Uh, and they were the rare ones. Most of them, I would say, even in, you know, the the honors classes, probably 90% of them went to college in the New York metropolitan area. So City College was a great opportunity. And I'd love to see more students today have that kind of opportunity of a free education if their circumstances require it. Because it was certainly a game changer for me. Yeah. You know, I I would have went to college, but, you know, would I have graduated in four and a half years? I frankly doubt it because I think I would have been working a lot. Um, and who knows, you know, how long that would have taken. And CCNY was very competitive academic environment. And again, um, you had to push yourself. There weren't teachers or you know, uh, pushing you necessarily, but they assumed you wanted to be there and they, they were great teachers and I got a great education and it cost me zero dollars. That's so I really feel for these students who've come out of school in the last 15 or 20 years and are burdened with student debt. Just, you know, I bought my first house six or seven years after I graduated from college. I had no debt. I didn't even have a credit card. <laughs> yeah. And you got a job fairly quickly. How did you get a job right out of college then? I found it in the New York Times. It was a, a placement We're agency. in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Your history teacher type. You had to, you had to buy the uh, uh, Sunday Times. You know, obviously, this was before you know, all the online ways to get a job today. Uh This was you, you open the Sunday times. There's a whole section by itself, a typical Sunday edition. It was probably 25 pages, you know, long pages, but you knew where, you know, what sections you were interested in. Went down to the placement agency. They explained the job to me, thought I had maybe the qualifications and then told me the company was standard and poor's and I needed to go take a test. I had good business courses and I thought I was probably pretty well prepared. What Didn't know what the test looked like, but showed up one morning and the, it was me and another guy taking the test that particular day and started talking while we were waiting to be called in and he had an MBA and I kind of thought, gee, <laughs> if they're only hiring one guy, I'm probably in bad shape. This guy's got two more years of school than I do. But then took the test and I got notified, I think within a week, that they wanted me to come in and they were prepared to offer me a position. And I was excited. It was the first real offer I had. I'd only been out of school about a month. And when I was going to start taking my MBA uh, part-time, what do you think and, uh, the advantage then to get that job over well, the MBA uh, guy? I later found out when I showed up for work, I asked the guy who had hired me if the other guy who had taken the test the same day had been hired also. I hadn't seen him. And he said, no, we, we decided not to offer him a position. So I said, you know, Mr. Sanborn, if I can ask you why, you know, he had an MBA and we were chatting before we came in. I thought I'd be at a disadvantage. And he said, your writing was so much better. He he had the tools. He knew they had, they had to do the analysis. But he said his writing was horrible. And that was part of the test. There was almost kind of like an essay. It was a letter you had to write. 
based on the analysis. I attribute my ability to master that to my high school and actually grammar school education, where all aspects of the English language were heavily emphasized. Huh. So while you know, I never contemplated a career as a writer, I knew you know, what the three different twos <laughs> meant. <laughs> Right. And, you know, homonyms and antonyms and everything and no dangling participles and, you know, don't finish this, you know, sentence with a, you know, a preposition. So I guess they thought I was a pretty good writer and enough of the analytical skills to qualify also. And that, that, was, a, that was a great start to my career. And then I was still at Standard & Poor's two and a half years later when they asked me to switch departments. And instead of being a stock analyst, I became a credit analyst and did that for about four and a half years. And it really rounded out my analytical skills. And at that point, I joined the small brokerage firm at that point, 1978. That was Keith Barrett and Woods. And I stayed there for 40 years. As so, I like to joke, I couldn't find another job. <laughs> so just backing up real quickly, what, what was your major in college then? Economics. But I had taken courses at Baruch, which was a sister school to CCNY, and that was totally business. So if you wanted more finance courses or accounting courses, took a couple of accounting courses at Baruch, because as I got into economics, I realized I really wanted to have a career in business or Wall Street, and you know, accounting and stuff like that would be helpful. So I took those, so I had that when, and I think some of that probably helped me get the job also that I had to economics can be a little theoretical, but my major is economics, but I, I had a lot of business courses, finance, accounting, stuff like that as an undergrad. So writing skills about economics were the thing that made or break. That was probably the, you know, the difference maker on that particular day for me. Well, I like to be an advocate for being a well-rounded human being, and that's kind of proof of it. You know, you, you can't just excel in one thing because if you can't express it, you know. Right. Cool. Yeah, and whether you're expressing yourself verbally or on paper, it's certainly helpful in, I think, almost any career. Yeah. Going to KBW, what was that environment like? And why did you stay there for 40 years? You obviously uh, could get another <laughs> job somewhere. So why did you love it? And I know you... Um, I, I really admired the people I worked for. Harry Keefe, I would say, is one of my business mentors. Uh, he had started the firm in 1962. He was a World War II vet, had gone to Amherst College, finished after the war, and commandeered a landing boat on D-Day. So he had a, and you know, this uh, World War II, you know, when I started working there, it was only 30 years earlier. So it was, it was like the generation above you, you know, had experienced that. He had started this firm with two other folks. It was about 50 people. It was about 15 years old when I joined the firm. I had about 50 people. Uh, they had already carved themselves out as being, you know, a, a quality research firm. I had, at S&P, I had a little dealing with them, and I got to know one of the senior people, a guy by the name of Mike Connor, who after a couple meetings we had had where he had a client in trying to get a rating at S&P, I, he was impressed with my work and approached me one day about whether I'd be interested in joining the firm. And I was at S&P six and a half years and invaluable experience. And I owe them a lot in terms of the opportunities they gave me. But I had started to feel that uh, the S Standard & Poor's was owned by McGraw-Hill, you know, a very large you know, company in the book world. And I kind of felt a large career opportunity at S&P might lead to McGraw-Hill, and that was pulling me away from Wall Street. And with six and a half years of dealing with Wall Street, I had really decided that's where I saw my career going. Rather than being kind of tangential to it, I really wanted to work for a firm on Wall Street. And while Keith Fred and Woods or KBW was not a household name, yeah, they specialized in financial services like banks, insurance companies, and other kinds of finance companies later on. I kind of liked the idea, I thought, of working for a smaller company. And it was 100% employee-owned. 
I guess I had some entrepreneurial instincts and in owning a piece of something. Yeah, you know, it was a lot different than you know my parents' situation. Yeah, you know, where they were working for somebody else. I kind of felt, gee, if I own part of this, you're kind of working for yourself in a way. Well, and um, so unusual in that they made their employees also be part investors. Yeah, after a year, when you were there a year, if they viewed you as a keeper, mm -hmm. they wanted you to buy stock. And if you didn't, that would have been a black mark. But it attracted people who wanted that because there were partnerships that were much bigger than KBW on the street. So that practice existed. Oh, okay. There were very few. The first brokerage company that went public, I believe, was Dallas Lufkin and Jen Rett, DLJ. We kind of modeled ourselves as a little mini DLJ, but they they were the first ones that had permanent capital, so to speak, because the other firms were owned by the partners. And when you retired, you know, you kind of got your capital out one way or another out of the firm and the younger guys would have an opportunity to, you know, to buy in. So it was just the model that sounded very appealing to me. The appeal of owning a piece of something struck a chord with me. Did you have like an event or something that, that inspired you to, oh, I would really like to work on Wall Street instead of sitting and analyzing? Well, I, I got my first break uh, my last year of college in a statistics course where a teacher came in, Professor Firestone, and said, a former student of mine is looking for a part-time helper. He's an economist, works for a subsidiary Merrill Lynch. If anybody's interested, see me after class. I was driving a cab at that point. Well, I went up to Professor Firestone. And I'm like, you know, do you have any idea what it pays? And he said, nope. Here's Ron Geller's phone number. You know, call him. Tell him you're, you know, you're in my statistics class. Call the guy up probably the next day. He said, when can you come down? I said, I can come down tomorrow if you want. Yep. Came down, he liked me, hired me. And that that, that really opened my eyes because uh, that was the first job that I had that had any kind of applicability or relativity to a career in Wall Street. Again, you know, great opportunity. I probably took a cut in pay from driving a cab, but it was it was a hell of a lot, hell of a lot safer. Uh -huh. uh, and obviously prepared me for having a better career you know, when I got out of college. Did you have any wild stories while you're driving a cab? <laughs> or uh, well, robbed a couple times, met a couple celebrities, minor stuff, nothing, nothing that ever made the paper. But again, it was dealing with the public. You know, you, sometimes you met people that when they got out of the cab, you loved them, whether they overtipped you or they told you an interesting story while they were your passenger. And then there were other people that got in and, you know, were completely miserable and complaining and you couldn't wait until you got them to their destination. So it was kind of good and bad. It paid pretty well for, a, you know, a 20 year old kid. We got paid the same as the career cab drivers. You know, if you didn't own your own cab and you weren't for a garage, you got 49% of the meter and you kept your tips. I liked it. Didn't always like Manhattan traffic, but you know, it was a job and I was getting paid. So beyond that, you know, I knew I didn't want to do that forever, but right. uh, I think I took some positives out of it. You seem to have a real attitude of, you know, take things as they come and roll with the punches. Yeah, I've learned there's no guarantees in life. And if you haven't learned that, you're probably in for some surprises and you have to be equipped to deal with those. I don't think anybody leads a perfect life or, you know, it goes completely according to what their plan might have been. I don't know if it was an advantage or not, not having some real specific goals. I kind of enjoyed the ride. And like when I thought I had an opportunity to step it up and maybe do even more than I imagined, I didn't see any reason to say no. I'd been able to handle whatever opportunities, you know, had presented themselves and was never afraid of hard work. I liked the people aspect, but when I started doing merger and acquisition work, you know, heavy involvement with clients and whatnot. And again, there were some great clients and some guys I'm still in touch with, even though I'm retired. And there were other people that when the deal was over, you were kind of glad it was over. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's life, you know, yeah. and it's kind of what you make of it to a large degree. 
Well, and I would think that that would really help you with some of the tragedies that you've had to deal with. I'm putting a link in the description for the book that you wrote. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the book Triumph Over Tragedy that John Duffy wrote. And most about the title, that picture with the flag. That picture of the flag was actually created by the wife of one of our bond salesmen. He survived the attack, but as she was dealing with him telling her the stories of the people we lost, she came up with this idea of recreating American flag. And if you look where the stars are, where we should have 50 stars, this woman decided we should have, that flag should have 67 stars because we lost 67 employees. Huh. And then the red and white stripes are actually the names of the people that we lost on 9-11, the employees, the 67 employees. And you'll see that that flag has been recreated and I've seen it in multiple places around the country. So there's a great story just the book, at the, cover. the book is interesting, but there's a story actually with the cover. Well, it's a beautiful book. I, it's a wonderful read, and I highly recommend you to read it. It's, again, very personalized. It brings you into the lives of the people who are involved and knowing more about you and how you think. I'd like to talk about it a little bit. 2001, before tragedy struck, CBW was doing incredibly well, the highest ratings and success, and then it was hit really hard. What happened? We were located in the South Tower of the, the World, Trade uh, World Trade Center. At that point, if my memory serves me right, we had 174 employees in New York. We had 50 employees. Uh, 50 other employees scattered around the country. We had some regional offices. Uh, but the bulk of the firm was headquartered in New York. When the second plane hit the South Tower, we were on the 88th and 89th floor. The plane hit down in the 60s or 70s. And if you were above where the plane struck, you were basically trapped. Now, the second plane hit about 15 minutes after the first plane had hit the North Tower. Uh -huh. So we did have some employees leave the building when the first tower had been hit, but they didn't know what had happened. It had hit the other side. We could see the North Tower from our offices, but the plane struck the other side of the building. So there were all sorts of rumors and you know stories. Uh, they felt the building shake. They thought a transformer or something had blown up. It took you probably five minutes to get all out of your office down to the ground floor because you had to take two elevators. So if you didn't leave in the first 10 minutes, you were probably going to be trapped. And we lost 67 employees. And that uh, also included a personal, uh, tell us about that as well. Yeah. Uh, my second son, Christopher, had graduated from Villanova in 2000. And he had interned one summer with us and on the trading desk. And the traders really liked them and we were growing and, and they were interested in hiring them. I wasn't sure whether that was a great move on his part, you know, being the boss's child has some definite pros, but can also have some negatives in terms of perceived favoritism and whatnot. But Christopher joined the firm upon graduation. So he'd been working there about 13 or 14 months. The traders and the research people and the salesmen are the first people that come in at a Wall Street firm. Market opens at 9.30. Most of those people are at their desk by 7.30. You know, the plane hit right around 9 o'clock. The bulk of the people that we lost were in those three departments, either the research department or the sales and trading people on the desk. A day, you know, I'll never forget. Clearly the saddest day of my life. Um, and, you know, besides losing one of my children, you know, I lost a lot of people, you know, several of whom I had worked with for 15 or 20 years, knew their families, you know, knew their wives or husbands, knew their children. So, you know, even as we started to rebuild the firm, there were, you know, there were constant reminders. We're trying to help the families who lost their primary breadwinner get through this. Uh, and we, you know, all of the employees who were had survived, you know, felt the sense of responsibility to help take care of some of those families until the government got compensation fund set up and distributed. You know, very, very difficult time, uh, personally, um, emotionally. But 
as we started to regroup after a couple of weeks, I, I didn't go to work for two weeks. The market was closed for four days after the attacks and took another week. And we had a, we had a service for Christopher and then eventually decided to go back and actually going back to help rebuild the farm. I felt was cathartic. It had some, I had something to do. Mm -hmm. I viewed it as something very positive because I kind of felt if we get the firm rebuilt, we could help these families financially. And that was important because, you know, a lot of these were young mothers, some cases were pregnant with their first child. Some of them had one, two, three kids. One mother actually had five children and lost her husband. And, you know, we tried to go to the services and whatnot. So the first first two to three months was really difficult. You just felt emotionally drained. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot to do to try to rebuild the farm. But then, like, a part-time job was, was going to see these families, you know, at memorial services and meeting with them and listening to them in terms of what their needs were. So very difficult, uh, you yeah. know day or period to get through um but we all bonded together and it really uh i think there was a commonality of interest in terms of you know we're going to do this and then we were fortunate and recruited some great people that wanted to be part of the rebuild said you guys had a great reputation i you know i want to work there i want to be one of the people that helps you rebuild this and we got it we got it done and five years later we had rebuilt the firm, had gone to London, and we wound up going public ourselves in 2006. Wow. Well, I know that President George Bush uh, made a speech in 2007 talking about outstanding people who had done something to rebuild, and he mentioned you specifically. Just the spirit of rebuilding. He, he quoted you because, you know, people questioned you, like, they want to give up at this point, and you had said, no, because that lets the enemy win or something like that. What was your mentality at the time? I'm trying to remember how many board members we actually had when 9-11 hit. I think we had 11. And I think we lost seven of the board members. So there was a remaining four people. And then we were, we were still employee-owned. And there was a group of uh, employees. Uh, a lot of them were actually in our Hartford office that had been with the firm between 10 and 20 years. So they had, you know, accumulated a, a fair chunk of stock. So they were, you know, significant shareholders in the company. We had considered before 9-11 uh, selling the company. We'd been approached by a foreign bank. The deal wasn't done, but it was still on track. And then obviously when 9-11 happened, the deal was off the table. And we had a dinner. There were probably 10 of us up in Stanford, Connecticut, to decide what we were going to do. We had intellectually or emotionally decided to rebuild the firm. We didn't want the last day of the firm to be September 10th or September 11th. In an interview that I gave probably on TV or something, uh, my quote was, you know, when we made the decision to rebuild, it was kind of like, we can't let the, the bad guys win. You know, we got we to gotta keep the fight going. And as I said earlier, it was cathartic. It gave me something to do, and I probably worked too hard for a couple of years. And it was on a mission, and a lot of my colleagues were too. Pretty much all of us stayed together. And, you know, when we were able to go public just a little a bit over five years after the 9-11 attacks, you know, it, we were kind of held up as a standard bearer of, you know, this is, you know, with a little luck and a lot of hard work and determination, you know, you can you can achieve probably what you never imagined. And certainly when we were rebuilding the firm in 2001, 2002, you know, we, uh, we had lost about a quarter of the firm's capital. You know, we had to pay that out to those families. That was $40 million. Fortunately, we had, we had more than enough capital to start the rebuild and as i said five years later we're going public which you know in any industry is kind of viewed as a standard of success what does that mean in terms of how you had built yourself up i mean just to compare from before well first of all we were a lot larger as i said we decided to expand into europe in 2004 so we had a london office and we were following banks on the continent we had 
a lot more employees. We had a lot more revenue. You know, and the joke I used to make around that time was after 9-11, we were in this constant hiring mode for about six months because we had basically 67 positions to fill. Hmm. And when we got there, we forgot to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it was like we just kept hiring people and growing. And there was, you know, there was a mentality, you know, a lot of senior people came in. And if they had an idea, it was and it was going to generate revenue. You know, they pretty much got a green light from us, hmm. uh, because you know we had a lot of lot of rebuilding to do, and it didn't have to look exactly like it had looked before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think generally the employees thought it was a great place to work. Hmm. And, you know, we had we had a brand name. We were giving them a lot of opportunity. It, in the early months or so, some of them later reflected to me that it was a little bit like walking on eggshells for the first month or two, because they knew, in a lot of cases, the people that filled the position had known the person at KBW who had died, whether it was a trader coming from another firm who had dealt with the KBW trader, whether it was another research analyst from a different firm, he knew the person from KBW. And they, you know, they kind of felt, you know, like, you know, I don't know if the, you know, the people who survived, they're going to embrace us because they're thinking about the friend they lost. But, you know, we were too busy to be bothered with any of that stuff. It was kind of like, we got to rebuild this place. And if you're going to help us, great. Once I think some of the employees got over that, that there, you know, there wasn't this stigma attached that they were a new employee as opposed to a prior you know old employee you really embraced it and we we had a nice run and then the crash came in 08 changed things a little bit but again we survived that i stepped down as ceo in the fall of 2011 and a little bit more than a year later we merged with a firm out of st louis called stiefel financial stiefel company and we still have the brand name. We're one of their, you know, wholly owned subsidiaries. Merger went very well. So while I'm retired, you know, the firm continues to live on. The ownership structure is obviously different, but I think it's still a great place to work. Still known for their expertise in the financial sector. So again, you know, I couldn't have possibly imagined any of that stuff back in 1978. Yeah, I was just looking to have a kind of a productive, rewarding career. But, you know, it turned out to be quite eventful. Well, to be the leader of the organization, especially in such hardship, what would you say are some of the mentors, whether you knew them or not, like larger than life people who have influenced your idea of leadership? Uh, well, I, as I think I mentioned, you know, I had the um, history teacher in high school that opened up the times to me and showed me a world that I didn't know existed. Uh Harry Keefe uh, was definitely one of my business mentors and the fellow who hired me and I worked for uh, in the early years, Michael Connor. I would say those, those three people probably singularly probably had the most influence on me in terms of kind of thought, you know, about what was out there. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, some of my early bosses at S&P, Steve Sanborn, guy hired me, obviously a game changer. You know, I went from a kid with a college degree and no job to, you know, a kid who had a job on Wall Street or closely related to Wall Street. Right. And then, you know, the, the, the head of the fixed income department, Russ Frazier, was another guy that clearly had an influence on me. You know, uh When I was, I said, I mentioned, I think earlier, I worked two years in the public library. Mm -hmm. I've never been a voracious uh, reader, but early in high school, I I decided I kind of liked reading biographies or autobiographies. And there Uh there are three that I probably mentioned to you that, you know, looking back, I still remember reading the book and thinking about the individual that the book was written about a lot in terms of what their lives were like. And I wouldn't say I followed any of them in terms of trying to be like them. Right. But how they dealt with the situations that they were dealt with and how they became famous or well-known 
first guy was Jackie Robinson. He was the first African-American Major League Baseball player. And my father was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. Jackie Robinson in the early 50s was kind of held up on a high standard. He had broken the color barrier in baseball. And when I got to the library and I saw, you know, a biography of Jackie Robinson, I picked it up, read it, super impressed, not just in his athletic talent, but how he was chosen as the individual to break the color barrier because the owner or the manager or the uh, general manager of the Dodgers branch, Ricky, knew whoever a team picked to be the first was going to face a lot of adversity. I think Jackie Robinson, besides being a great ball player, was picked because they viewed his temperament as being able to have a better chance of handling the situations that he was likely to face. So he was a he was a pretty unusual back in those days. He was a college graduate. He had played uh, football at UCLA. So he was you know, multi-talented sport-wise, but had gotten a college education. And I think Branch Rickey thought that was important in terms of having somebody mature that was going to be able to handle some of the situations, rac- racial discrimination that he was going to face. Uh, so that was the first one. And I probably read it because he was a sports figure, you know, but it raised my consciousness, certainly on the racial issues. And then in college, my sister had read something about Gandhi. This was during, you know, the initial kind of racial uprising or whatever you want to call it, demonstrations in the 60s. And I read a biography of Gandhi and his whole thing of of nonviolent demonstration. And I think the famous kind of description of Gandhi was, you know, the little man in the loincloth who brought down the British Empire. And and reading that, um, and, you know, the famous march to the sea and the revolt of the salt tax and, you know, how this country that I still haven't been to could have achieved what it achieved in terms of independence. Uh, you know, there were lives lost, but you no, know, it was nothing that Gandhi was, you know, promoting. Uh-huh. Uh, I found it to be a truly remarkable story. I think it's had some effect on my thoughts about resolving conflicts, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, political conflicts or personal conflicts, the violence usually doesn't achieve too much. Uh, so it clear that his story clearly had an impact on how I view life. And then the third one was probably right around when I was finishing college and CCNY was located in Harlem. My senior year, there was a lot of demonstration about changing the admission policies at the city university. I think it was actually in a sociology course I took that the teacher recommended reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm. And my perception of Malcolm X had been that he was pretty far out on the curve. Yeah. And I really wasn't sure that I was going to read the book, but I picked it up and read it. And it, it was an autobiography. It was so well written in terms of his describing his emotions and feelings and the life he had gone through early in his life, I think is very relevant today in terms of this thought about white privilege and you know racial discrimination and whatnot. And I've recommended that book to people. I'm like, you don't necessarily, I'm not saying you're going to agree with his philosophy. And, you know, clearly there were problems with the Islam thing, which actually led to his assassination. But if you read the first half of the book in terms of kind of the life he had and how he he got himself turned around, I thought was hugely inspirational. You know, he wound up He was probably assassinated, would have been right around the time, I guess, I was getting out of high school. It was before I went into CCNY, so I probably read, you know, the autobiography five or more years after it was published. But he was assassinated in the Autobahn Ballroom, which was 
literally 15 blocks from the CCNY campus. So yeah, I used to get off the train at 145th Street and walk through the campus. Uh, every day I was walking through the neighborhood you know, where he had lived part of his life. It's a long time since I read those three books, but I remember a lot of them, and I certainly remember how they, I think, changed my thinking about, you know, the society that we live in. Well, you know, especially like the stereotype of a Wall Street kind of guy, you you think of this kind of, you know, self-absorbed, you know, doesn't help anybody else, just greedy, you know, I mean, that's a a stereotype. And there are those that are like that. They get into all kinds of drugs, they get into all kinds of lifestyle problems because like it's too intense for them. Would you say that their influence on you kept you more just on a balanced lifestyle or way of thinking? Yeah, I think growing up in the South Bronx, and I've stayed involved with my high school, which is 98% minority, Hispanic or African American. And it was not those percentages when I went, it was probably 15 to 20% minority. So, you know, demographics certainly changed when I was in high school. It was largely Italian, Irish, and everything else. And today it's Hispanic and, and African American. Yeah, I've never lived in the first 70 years of my life. I never lived more than 25 miles from where I was born. Hmm. So I've never gotten that far away from you know the New York area. I mean, I've lived in either the city proper or one of the surrounding counties my entire life. And that was the melting pot of America. You know, I was exposed to a lot of different cultures. I had a strong Irish heritage in my family because my parents were born there. But that got diluted as you went to something other than the neighborhood school. You know, when you when I went to high school, it was a lot of Italian, a lot of Irish, and, and a lot of everything else. CCNY was very heavy. Probably half the student body was Jewish, so different religion. So, you know, I think kind of growing up and being exposed in a very mixed environment probably made me more tolerant of other people's, you know, situation or culture. They weren't necessarily what I grew up in for the first 15 years, but, you know, different doesn't mean worse. You've been more than uh, tolerant. You've been, in fact, very generous. You've got a a big philanthropic um, effort that you've given to a lot of different people. I know my own career has benefited from your help and helping me to launch my show in Branson and projects that I've been doing which I publicly am here thanking you very much. And I'm very excited about the opportunities that I couldn't have done without your help. And I know you've influenced a lot of students. You've been giving to that high school. You give to colleges. You're on boards of all kinds of educational things. Maybe you can also tell us a little bit more about some of these people that you've affected. Yeah, my passion is education because I really felt the opportunity that I got in high school and college was a game changer. I would regard myself as bright, but I was in high school and college with people that had higher GPAs or averages and IQs. So, you know, you need a certain level of intelligence to succeed, but a lot of the opportunity that you have is based on what you've learned. And there, you know, given the background that I had, you know, there was no way I could have expected to have had the career I wound up having, uh, Mm. except for the education. While the racial makeup of the students at my old high school is different today, they look just like the kids I went to high school with. They, you know, they might be Hispanic as opposed to Italian, or they might be African American as opposed to uh, Irish or German. But they behave the same way we behave, you know? They're full of life. And one of the reasons I've been as generous as I have been to that school is universities or colleges today are trying to, they may not be doing enough, but there are plenty of them that are trying very hard to recruit minorities. And, and I felt if I could get, uh, you know, one of these students through high school, and be academically qualified so he could go to a good institution, there will be monies made available to him by the, by the Yales of the world. I really view it as a multiplier effect. If I spend X dollars to get one of these kids through high school, because there is a tuition there, 
these guys have a pretty good chance of parlaying that into a college scholarship where the ticket's a lot more expensive. So I view it as kind of a return on investment. I mean, you know, I don't get a financial return, but I get an emotional human return that if I spend X on this kid, he can, he can turn it into scholarships that are worth five or 10 X. And that's, you know, that's pretty good multiplier in my book. And that's, you know, beyond that, it's kind of betting on people. If I meet people that I like, I think with a little mentorship or guidance or financial aid can put them on a different career track or path or opportunity, you know, I get the same kind of emotional return from that. Some of the students I backed that, you know, I didn't really know until after I became their sponsor, but I have enough confidence that the school's good enough that even if the student's a little rough around the edges, going in whether it's you know personality or academic ability that the school get them to the standard that you know that they need to get to and i i also find it enlightening to stay in in touch with the younger generations and also Mm -hmm. people in different fields because you can get you know you can get a real case of the blinders Mm -hmm. if you've been at the same firm for 40 years doing the same thing you can get pretty limited by the time you reach social security in terms of your horizon so you know i think especially after 9 11 i was just in a position that i could do some of this and found it invigorating you know Mm -hmm. um, and continue to do it just because it feels good and i can do it well, I, I remember reading in your book how uh, you, you didn't actually, you had all these offers. People wanted books. They wanted all these things written right after 9-11. And you basically said, no, we didn't have to build this back up. We don't have time. But then you had decided to go ahead and write Triumph Over Tragedy. What, what was the reason that you decided to redo that? Or, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Because um, right after 9-11, the TV networks, some movie producers, yeah. uh, authors, they all realized this was probably, you know, once in a generation opportunity for them to do, you know, some piece of work uh, around 9-11. So we were deluged in the first two months with opportunities. People that wanted to do magazine pieces, people that wanted to write books. One guy wanted to do a documentary. And we were so busy, we didn't have time I mean, we were working 12, 15 hours a day to find a home. We didn't have offices. The employees we had were sket, you know, spread out over five locations in the city and then the I think four offices we had around the country. We had to hire a ton of people. Yeah. Um, so we, we couldn't imagine taking time out to sit down you know, with a movie guy or an author. Right. And about eight months later, well into 2002, I got a phone call from a woman, Mary Schaefer, who had been a client of mine earlier in my career. And I hadn't talked to her probably in five years. When she got me on the phone, I asked her what she was doing because I hadn't talked to her. And she told me she had become an author and she wanted to do a book on KBW and 9-11. And I'm like, Mary, you know, you know, we turned down a dozen folks, six, eight months ago and she said it wouldn't be very intrusive she had an idea how to do it and would I give her a half hour to kind of run through it because she had been a client I felt I owed her that so she came in one day I said listen while I probably got A's and B's in English you know I have no interest in really writing a book I don't have the time and I don't think I have the inclination and she said the way she would handle that is she was going to give me a tape recorder And whenever I felt comfortable, just record some of my thoughts about the day, you know, maybe one tape on the history of the firm, another tape on what I was doing that morning, you know, what happened after the attacks. And I listened to her and I figured out, yeah, I I guess I could do that. But I wasn't really sure if the firm wanted the publicity. Mm -hmm. So as I had explained to Mary about, you know, what had happened to the employees and that some had gotten out, that she'd want to interview those people, you know, besides talking to me, I said, well, you know, I need, I need to talk to anybody that might get dragged into this book to decide, 
you know, should we do this collectively? This, I really wasn't comfortable making the decision myself, even though I would be listed as the author because it would help sell the books. Mary was really the ghostwriter and she gets, you know, co-author credit. But I called about six or eight people in, in the firm together one day and I said, listen, we turned down all these opportunities to do books and the documentary and other things. But I said, I had a meeting you know, a couple of days ago with this woman who used to be a client and I explained the situation to everybody. And then I told them that they would be asked to give their version of the story. And while that wasn't mandatory, I, you know, I was kind of curious who was willing to participate and who wasn't. After everybody talked, we kind of went around the table and decided we'd take a vote whether we were going to say yes or no. And some people were in favor of it. Some people were against it and wouldn't participate for personal reasons. Some people thought it was an opportunity to make money and were wondering who was going to, who was going to get the proceeds. And we kind of made the decision, you know, ad hoc at that moment that if we decided to go ahead, any profits uh, that the book might generate, that we would donate all the proceeds to, we have a KBW family fund to, that money we raised to kind of help these folks. And then we got to the last guy in the room, a guy by the name of Bob Planner, one of our salesmen. And he said, I've heard everybody's pros and cons. And he was an EMT worker on the side. So he had left the building when the when the first plane hit with the wow. idea of going downstairs to help. Wow. He didn't know what he was going to be seeing. He didn't imagine there were going to be people jumping out of the North Tower. But the reason he was alive, was he left early that when the first plane hit the other tower. And he said, Duff, we ought to do this. And there's one reason we ought to do this. And it's got nothing to do with money or anything or our personal stories. He said, we got to do it for the 40 kids who lost their parents that day and most of them are too young to understand what really happened so we need to write this book so when they get older they can read this book and learn more about the parent they lost and you know the seven of us other than bob in the room looked at each other and we all went duh wish i had thought of that and he was absolutely right and everybody in the room you know agreed to go forward Wow, that's a powerful reason. Has anybody contacted you as a result of reading the book or, or anything like that? Or is it oh yeah, we got you know we got people that picked it up randomly, thought it was inspirational, and wished us luck. We published it on the first anniversary of nine eleven, so it was uh, published in two thousand and two. Never made it to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, but not yet. We did make <laughs> we did make a little money on it. Uh, contributed to the family fund and you know there are parents over the years who came back and told one of us or another that you know they were happy we did it that it's something that they've been able to show their children at the appropriate time to you know when they start asking questions about you know what happened to daddy or what happened to mommy that they can show them the book and you know the children read it so it's hard to always, you know, really be able to personalize something you hear about on the news, but be able to read a story and, and really be able to connect emotionally with the people involved. It's a, it's a treat. I, so I would definitely have a link in the description for people who'd like to purchase it. It's on amazon.com. That's, you know. Yeah, you can probably get it on Amazon for about three bucks these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great deal. <laughs> Now that you're in retirement, I guess I have two remaining questions. One would be, uh, what's ahead for you? Yeah, well, certainly if we ever get a vaccine, I plan on doing some traveling. I was down in Florida for about three months as a stepfather who's still alive and had a, had a kind of tend to him. But we came back up to New York area that two weeks ago. I had some vacations planned that have been you know, put on hold or canceled. So I'd like to do that. I you know, was fortunate. I saw a lot of the world, but there are some places I hadn't been to that sound pretty interesting. So I've got a little, little bit of a bucket list. Still serving on several nonprofit boards. My high school, the Board of the Endowment, an Irish organization in New York City, the Irish Arts Center. We're building a new home for the, uh, for the Arts Center another educational institution up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So edu education, I'll stay involved 
I'm not sure exactly which boards, how long. Mm -hmm. uh, I still feel like I have maybe too much. Could pare the list down a little bit. I am an investor in a uh, food company out in California. I'm actually the chairman of the board. So it's got nothing to do with banks or financial services, but it's a fellow that I kind of bet on. 15 years ago, and we're doing pretty well. So it keeps me connected mm -hmm. to the business world in a yeah. much reduced role. Some responsibility or accountability, as, you know, being on the board, but not a lot on the day-to-day -day business. And it's new for me. I had no background in the food business. And with people cooking at home and restaurants in trouble, it's, there's been a lot to read, mm. especially in the last, you know, three to six months. So I find it, you know, kind of intellectually stimulating thinking about, you know, some of those issues and how they're affecting different parts of the industry. So I think it keeps the brain active. Mm -hmm. um, gives you something when you get up in the morning to kind of do. Yeah. I'm a golfer, but I'm not a good enough that I want to play every day. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. But, uh, I, I'm certainly, you know, some people retire and they say, are you bored? And I'm like, I don't think I've ever been bored in my life. <laughs> Maybe a couple of, you know, evenings, you know, early on in the virus when I wasn't a Netflix subscriber in Florida, you know, no sports to watch. And you kind of got tired of either listening to the president or if you were leaning another way, listening to Andrew Cuomo. You know, after you kind of learned a little bit about the virus, you know, you don't want to listen to it every night. But I've, I've usually had enough on my plate to keep me busy. You know, I've got four kids. I've got seven grandkids. So there's, there always seems to be somebody to FaceTime to or text. And um, I'm blessed in that fashion. Well, I guess so. My final question, which can uh, have several different branches, but it's really about, um, you know, we're going through tough times. A lot of people are very unsure about the future. There's a lot of upheaval economically, politically. I mean, we're, we're going through some tough times. And you having been through the Vietnam era, you having been through 9-11, you having been through these, these pretty epic, uh, and right in the heart of these epic um, occasions, what advice would you like to impart? Just how to handle this? I think it's an excellent question, Janice. And I'm not sure anybody has the perfect answer because while I've lived through some things that, you know, may make it into the history books, I don't think I've ever seen anything like what we're dealing with here. You know, the people that I've been in communication with on a personal level who I feel are dealing with inordinate amount of stress mm -hmm. that's induced uh, by the virus, you know, just try to counsel them that, you know, this will pass. We'll get a vaccine. I don't know when. I don't know how to do that. So there's, there's an element of blind faith in our some very smart people. You know, I was reading one about uh, an article last night, and it was this fellow's got this biotech company. I probably understood 10% of what I was reading, but <laughs> it's all about the DNA and his Turkish guy and his wife and they're partnering I believe with Pfizer it was a fascinating article even though I, I, I didn't understand a lot of the terminology or you know, the depth of the article but I've got faith that it's whether it's those people or somebody else it will help us find a cure and we'll eventually get back to whatever the new normal is going to be so some of this stuff is outside your control and I, I think the advice is you can't drive yourself crazy you know, you have to take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a mother and you're trying to do homeschooling, you've got to try to take care of your kids. And the husband, if he's fortunate enough to be working, has got to appreciate the stress that, you know, the wife is under if she's doing the homeschooling and why his kids may be behaving differently. You know, it's got there's a, a waterfall kind of effect. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest I've got any of those answers except, you know, be smart and take care of yourself. And that, that means don't, don't have an extra drink. Drinking's fine. I'm Irish, but drinking's <laughs> not going to cure the stress that you may be under yet. You've, 
whether you can deal with it yourself or that you need help from family members or friends or professional help. Uh, I think you have to view things optimistically that this is not going to be the case, you know, status quo uh, forever. But, you know, listen to the medical professionals. I have an enormous respect for that. Dr. Fauci, he, A, first of all, he's the New Yorker. Secondly of all, he went to a Catholic high school in New York. So <laughs> he's older than me, but, and he's smarter than me, but I'll, I'll follow his advice. And if he uh -huh. thinks masks work, you know, I was a little uncomfortable putting a mask on, you know, the first couple of days. Right. But I was uncomfortable when somebody convinced me to wear a seatbelt. And now I do it automatically. Good point. And how long does it take? You know, the signs on the, the Garden State Parkway say, you know, three three seconds to buckle up can add years to your life. Well, yeah. you know, the three seconds it takes to put a mask on may add years to your life. So why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. And, you know, now that, you know, I was in Florida until about two weeks ago, and now Florida's numbers are huge. And the biggest age group I understand from reading, I think it's accurate, are, you know, the young adults, kind of 25 to 40. Mm. It's like, you know, your world is not going to end if you don't go to the bar Friday night. Mm -hmm. Have a Zoom conference call like some of my friends, you know, once a week. Yeah, you need the social interaction because we're social animals. And yeah. that whether you're 20 years old or 40 or 70, you used to that social interaction. So yes, of course you need it, but you know, you got to find out some way of doing it safe yeah, and being that's, smart. That's such a great point about the seatbelt. I, cause I've, I've traveled in Japan a lot in Japan, people, you know, if they have a cold or, you know, they're whatever, they wear masks all the time way before the virus hit. And I thought that was so bizarre. Like you, I'm doing a concert and people have masks on in the audience. And I, I just thought that was so strange. And then here we are, I'm thinking, wow, like uh, they obviously knew what they were doing. It's just an interesting thing. It's just a, a mind shift. I had this same exact experience in Tokyo. My first trip to the Orient was in, I believe, February of 08. And, um, it was actually the weekend the Giants beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's why I remember yeah. it was February of 08. Uh, I don't remember what Super Bowl number that was, but uh, we landed um, in uh, Tokyo uh, Sunday morning. So it was still Saturday night in New York. So we had 12 or 18 hours until the Super Bowl game started. But uh, we were going over to this office building Monday morning. It was Sunday night in uh, in the East Coast or the West Coast, wherever the wherever the Super Bowl was that year, to watch the Super Bowl in an office. And we took a cab from the hotel over to this office building, and people were coming out of the subway. And I would say one out of every ten people had a mask on. So when we got to the office building, met the guys who were hosting us and we're going to watch the game, I asked one of them, I said, is there some kind of, you know, outbreak? Yes. Half the people, I exaggerated, was it half? It might have been 10 or a little bit more percentage of the people were wearing masks. And I, I'd never seen anything like this. And he said, oh, no, there's nothing special. But, you know, in our culture, you know, it would be viewed as being impolite to cough or sneeze on somebody and the subways are pretty crowded. Yeah. So he said, you know, they're doing it to prevent, you know, spreading any germs on somebody that they might be standing next to. And I thought that was not extreme, but certainly different than behavior on the New York city subways. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, when the virus hit here and they started talking about masks, and, you know, Taiwan, especially, and I, I believe South Korea initially, and I think also Japan, you know, did a pretty good job of minimizing, you know, the, you know, multiplier effect and, and it turning into being a lot worse than it might have been because they're used to this. It's part of their culture. Well, it's not part of our culture to walk around wearing a mask. But if your health depends upon it, it probably should be part of your culture, at least for 
whether it's three weeks or three months or however. Yeah. I did some food shopping this morning and it's not required, but I'm like, um, I don't want to give it to somebody else. I don't think I have it, but so many people are asymptomatic and it may help prevent me from getting it from somebody else. And the cashiers now have these plexiglass barriers. So things are different. Doesn't mean they're worse. No. It means, you, you know, you've got to do something. Your behavior's got to change a little bit if you want to protect your health and the health of others. Yeah. Well, again, you seem to go with the flow. I'm not that good looking. So putting a mask up on me, you know, <laughs> there's no negative impact. Well, I heard that with the women, they can't really, you know, show their faces. So lipstick sales have gone down. Oh. Eyelash sales have gone up. So I'm going to get on the bandwagon. I'm going to sell magnetic <laughs> eyelashes. <laughs> Mark my words. <laughs> I find when I put it over my nose, my glasses fog up periodically. So sometimes I cheat and I put it down a little bit or I try to shop without my glasses. Yeah, we need to invent like the whole combination. <laughs> glasses and the mask and I'm right. sure I'm sure somebody out there that's a million dollar idea. I just gave it away. Somebody can do that. <laughs> um so, so what kind of impact do you want to leave on the world? Well, yeah, I, I actually have to go to a wake tomorrow. One of my friends passed away from pan pancreatic cancer, had it for three or four weeks. You know, shocking how quickly he deteriorated. And, you know, the funeral home wrote a little obituary for him, and my kids and I read it yesterday, and I'm like, you know, they did a very good job of capturing who the, who the personality was, who the person was. You know, and I... In terms of any kind of legacy, I mean, I think the most important one I'm leaving is my kids and, and my grandkids. But, you know, I would like people to say, you know, he was a good guy. You know, he had his priorities straight. He gave back, came, you know, had a successful career, but he didn't forget where he came from. Uh, that's probably the most important thing to me because, you know, without some of the opportunities that were given to me, I wouldn't be in the position to do some of the things I do in terms of charitable donations and whatnot. I know the people that were the beneficiaries of those things won't forget, but I, you know, the people that weren't directly impact, you know, I'd like them to have that thought because if they're in a position, you know, maybe if they think that was a positive with the way I led my life, maybe it'll have an impact on, on their behavior. So pay and it forward. Some pay it forward. Exactly. Uh, you know, that term only got created in the last five or 10 years. So we were doing that before, you know, we had the terminology for it, but that's exactly it. It When you leave, you want the earth to be a better place than it was or it would have been without you, you know, and some people can have big impacts and some people it might be almost immeasurable, but, you know, Whatever you can do, you, if you can make it a better place, then we'll all better off. It is a, you know, aggregation benefit, you know, uh, multiple aspects. So, you know, we, we all pass away and um, you'd rather have people think positively about the time you spent here and that you did have a positive impact than them thinking, boy, I'm glad that you know, crusty old son of a bitch is dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to say? Or no, I, well, yeah, I, and I've given this to students and it's not educational advice, it's more life advice. If you find something you're passionate about, and I know you're passionate about your music, um, you know, I think there's a very strong correlation to uh, your success whether it be in school or whether it's in a career or something that you do in your adult life that's not directly your career, that if, if it's something you're really passionate about and when you get out of bed in the morning and you put your feet on the ground and you're like looking forward to doing that thing, you're going to do it better than something that you're either dreading doing or you know, marginally engaged. Advice that I've kind of given to young adults is find something that, you know, really gets your motor going 
And if you're lucky enough to do that, because I think a lot of people just never, never find that and don't turn that magic switch on. But if you're lucky enough to find something and, and it's not economics, it doesn't mean you're going to achieve greater financial success, but I think you'll be a much happier individual and you'll feel like you're contributing. High school and student, uh, college students that I've gotten involved with, I've never really tried to tell them they should go to one career or another. I can lay out some facts that, you know, in terms of what career opportunities there are. But, you know, I'm not inside their soul or their brain or their heart in terms of what really makes them tick or uh -huh. what's going to make them happy or feel like they're a success. You've got, you kind of got to figure that out by yourself. I think if you've had some guidance, um, you may find it earlier than other people. Like I know your sisters were, you know, accomplished musicians. So, you know, your, your career path may have been, I don't want to say preordained, but you were certainly guided. Mm -hmm to that aspect, not exclusively, but um, yeah, I think that can be helpful. And, you know, I tried to expose my children to different things when they were growing up because I didn't assume they would have the same interest that I would. Mm -hmm. And as they've had kids now, it's kind of like I've got a, a grandson. I have zero musical talent. When people used to ask me, do I play an instrument? And I used to say, I play the radio. That's the only instrument I know how to play. Mm -hmm. I used to play the bugle a little bit in the Sea Cadets and Grammar School. But uh, one of my grandsons is seven and just started taking piano lessons. And I think it's wonderful because it looks like he may have an aptitude for it. I tried to, you know, expose my children to that, but, you know, the musical talent may have skipped a generation or may, it, it may be brand new with this one, but I think it's wonderful. And I, I don't have the music background, but I appreciate, mm -hmm. yeah, to some extent, the different arts. Music is probably the one I get the most enjoyment out of. And I think it's wonderful. I mean, I hope he kind of sticks with it. And when we have family gatherings, you know, Finn can get on the piano and entertain us. I mean, what, what could be more enjoyable than that? And how many grandkids do you have now? Uh, I got number seven arrived in the middle of the virus up in Boston. I haven't yet seen her. Granddaughter number four, and I have uh, three grandsons. I had the three grandsons first, so I've had four granddaughters in a row. So we're on a bit of a female role here. Very cool, though. Yep, very. I'm very proud. Very exciting and satisfying, and can't wait to see Winnie. She's the new one. Well, John, thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much for taking this time to talk to all of us and for all the many, many contributions you have made. I know uh, we haven't even kind of touched on all of them. I know you've contributed to inner city education um, and you have had an impact on a lot of people's lives. It's been very inclusive and you know, sharing knowledge with people and encouraging them rather than you know, closing yourself off and just being in a competitive kind of way. And I just admire that so much, as well as your calm way of handling the most chaotic and scary things. You, uh, you've been a role model in my life, certainly. So well, thank you, Janet. It was, usually I don't like to talk about myself too much, but I, I really feel blessed and fortunate that I've had the life I've had. When I was growing up, I forget how old, I was when I read Great Expectations by Dickens. That that was not what I was, you know, thinking as a child, Great Expectations. It was kind of survive in advance. That's a terminology a uh, famous basketball coach used when he got to the tournament, Jim Valvano, who won the national championship in 1983 at North Carolina State. The goal was to win the championship, but they were not they were far from the favorite and he convinced his team all we have to do is win six games and we got to win them one at a time and nobody else has the championship so it's like it's there for all our taking we just have to win six games in a row and his favorite phrase was survive the game and advance to the next round and I kind of 
I mean, that happened, you know, in the eighties and, uh, you know, my attitude kind of before that was like, take each day at a time, take each problem and try to solve those. And again, take care of your own problems first. You know, if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to do a real good job solving other people's problems. But, you know, if you're in a position where your life is in pretty good order, you know, however you want to define that financially or otherwise, then you can start to do some stuff for other people. And that has been very rewarding to me. I mean, I've really, the places where I've been on the board, it's a collective effort and there may be 10, 12, 15, 20 people in a room. So you're part of a collective team effort, but you know that, you know, together you are making a difference. You know, that if, if collectively we didn't spend the time given the institution, the organization, the guidance that you're giving it, you know, somebody else would have to do it. And if nobody steps up, it's not going to get done or it's going to get done very poorly. So, you know, if you have the ability to, to be helpful to people, it is terribly rewarding. I mean, there's not, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's board meetings, a little inconvenient. It's cutting in on your schedule, but there's been very few board meetings when, when I've left saying, Oh, that was wasted two hours. <laughs> Most of the time is completely the opposite. Oh, I'm so glad I came because somebody came up, somebody else came up with an idea. And if we can do this and we can do that, we can make a difference. And that's that's rewarding. And certainly being part of a team. That's yeah, neat. Exactly. And I've always thought I I do better. Sometimes I'm going into a meeting at KBW and I'm like, I'm not sure what we're even going to talk about. But you put five or ten reasonably smart people in a room, somebody's got an idea and you start talking about it. And then, you know, when somebody says something, it turns the switch on in your brain and you start contributing. Yeah. I I, I love the phrase, the sum is greater than the parts. Yeah, everybody absolutely. You get so much more than just individually. Right. And I don't view myself as being creative. I was in rooms with people where they had, you know, kind of the, the essence of an idea. And then I was able to say, yeah, you know, that's a really good idea. But, you know, if we add this to it or we did it a little different, I think it would even be better, you know. And that's how – I think that's how things happen a lot of times in the business world. Yeah. People rarely cr create things in a vacuum, even if they yeah. think they do, or they try to take credit for it. It rarely <laughs> happens that way. A lot of people try to take credit for it <laughs> <laughs> in the business world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, in the arts world, too. I yeah. mean, if anybody says they're self-made, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's an enjoyment, and you, 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 know, you share in somebody else's success that you, know, you had a role to. <laughs> yeah, I've seen... I mean, when student I sponsored wound up on our doorstep in the Bronx from Nigeria, marginal student because his English wasn't very good. And he just finished his first year at an MBA program at Manhattan College. He's a wow. college graduate and now he's going for his you know postgraduate work and he's halfway done. And this was a fellow who needed work to qualify, you know, to get into colleges, but he's a hardworking kid. And, uh, and I know uh, he still doesn't have permanent resident status in the U.S., but I'm hope, hoping he gets it. It has clearly made a difference in his life the last five or six years. And I think if he gets resident status, his life here is going to be a lot different and better than it would have been back in Nigeria. Cool. Yep. John, thank you so very much. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. Janice, good to see you again. Good to see you. Take care. One New Yorker understood corporate responsibilities, a fellow named John Duffy. John Duffy grew up in the Bronx. He became CEO of a Manhattan investment and research firm called Keith Bruett and Woods. On September the 11th, KBW had its offices in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. That day, the firm lost 67 people, including John's 23-year-old son. Many thought KBW was finished, but not John Duffy. 
He moved his company to temporary offices. He paid out $40 million to the families of the employees the firm lost. He set up a charitable trust to help them with medical bills and college expenses. And he rebuilt his business. Last year, KBW went public. And now the firm has twice as many employees as it did on September the 11th. I want the people to listen to what John Duffy said. If that day was our final day, it would have meant that the bad guys had won. Our way to fight back was to keep going. It says something about John Duffy that the terrorist attacks only made him more determined to succeed. It says something about New York that there are countless stories like KBW's of hardworking men and women who picked themselves up and rebuilt bigger and better than before. It says something about America that we continue to produce citizens who come back from adversity and create new opportunity for themselves and for others. And this is the true strength of our economy. That's what makes us the economic leader of the world. And that's why I'm confident they would remain that economic leader. Because we're a nation of dreamers and doers and believers, God-fearing, decent, honorable people. And I'm proud to be the president of such a nation. God bless. Thank you.